Chapter 11, Odd Number Problems 5 through 11. Number 5, a sample of n equal to 9 individuals participates in a repeated measure study that produces a sample mean difference of m sub d equals to 4.25 with a sum of square deviations equal to 128 for the different scores. Calculate the standard deviation for the sample of different scores. Briefly explain what is measured by the standard deviation. So this is going back to our um, understanding of skills developed in Chapter 4, just simply calculating the standard deviation. Standard deviation is equal to the square root of our variance, our sample variance, so we're going to need to calculate variance first. Variance is equal to the sum of squared deviations over degrees of freedom. So in this case, it would equal 128 degrees of freedom would be n degrees of freedom equals n minus 1. So in this case, it would be 9 minus 1 is equal to 8. So 128 divided by 8 in our calculators. 128 divided by 8 gives us 16. And again, if we want to calculate standard deviation, we simply take the square root of our variance, square root of, let me erase this for a second. So variance, excuse me, standard deviation is the square root of our variance. Our variance is equal to 16. So our standard deviation would equal 4. Going back to what we learned um, in chapter 4 as to what standard deviation represents, we recognize that standard deviation represents the difference, or the average, I should say, the average difference or distance between scores, x values, and the mean of a distribution. So visually we can think of in the center we have a sample mean, then we have an x value and an x value and another x value. And again, it's the difference, the average difference between um, all of the x values in the center um, mean of the distribution. Now if we um, look at B, we'll recognize that what we're asking to calculate is something slightly different. Calculate the estimated standard error for the sample mean difference. Briefly explain what is measured by the estimated standard error. So this is the creation of a, of a t distribution that comes from the mean difference. So whenever we have um, a first sample, we have those x values, and to calculate the difference, we know that we take our second x value and subtract our first x value. So again, we've learned from our reading, d, or the difference score, is equal to the second x value minus the first x value. And then we can calculate an average of those different scores, and then we can co construct a distribution of sample mean differences and see how it relates to the hypothesized population mean difference, which comes from the null, and would equal zero. So our new equation, which looks very familiar from chapter nine, is the estimated standard error of the mean difference is equal to um, our variance, the square root of our variance over n. And we now have our variance, so we would enter the square root of 16, and the sample size is equal to 9. So in our calculator, 16 divided by 9, and take the square root, and we should get 1.33. And now our understanding, understanding the estimated standard error of the mean difference is represents the average difference or distance between sample, let me write that again, 
sample mean differences for and let me just do the notation m sub d and the population mean difference which is mu sub d and again that's uh, the population mean difference again coming from the null that the null would state that between condition one and condition two we would see no difference in score so the average difference would equal zero um, so the estimated standard error of the mean difference represents the average difference between all possible sample mean differences all m sub d values and the hypothesized population mean difference Number seven, a repeated measure study with a sample of n equal to nine partic participants produces a mean difference equal to three with a standard deviation equal to six. Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. Determine whether it is likely that this sample came from a population equal to or population mean difference equal to zero. So when it says is it likely that it came from that um, from that population, that's implying that this sample mean would be really close to zero, whereas if it were to say if it's unlikely, then it would be something very different from zero. So we're going to first begin with finding our critical t. To do so, we need to figure out what our degrees of freedom are equal to. Again, similar to chapter 9, degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. And so in this case, degrees of freedom would equal 9 minus 1 is equal to 8. Again, um, recognize that um, each individual will have two scores, um, but those individuals are repeated in the second condition or multiple conditions. So again, we would have 18 total scores, but 9 participants um, because they're repeated in the other or second condition. All right, once we have that, we can use that in our T distribution to find our critical T. Again, we're going to um, use a two-tailed test with alpha at 0 0.05. Okay, so our degrees of freedom is equal to 8, and we're going to use a two-tailed test. So we're going to use the second tier, two-tailed test at 5%. So we'll see where those intersect and we get a t critical t value of positive negative 2.306 so our critical t is equal to positive negative 2.306 and we're going to set our critical region negative 2.306 positive 2.306. We've defined the critical region to help us draw our conclusions about this particular t value or mean difference. And now we'll need to calculate our t value. So our t in this equation is, or this chapter, is the sample mean difference between conditions 1 and 2 minus the hypothesized population mean difference, which comes from the null and is always equal to 0 and divided by the estimated standard error of the mean difference. So we'll need to calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. And um, in the previous example, we used a different equation because we had variance. And in this case, we have our standard deviation value. So the alternate equation is standard deviation over the square root of n. And our standard deviation is equal to 6, which was a given and we have n equal to 9, so the square root of 9. So essentially we have 6 over 3, and we get estimated standard error of the mean difference equal to 2. Now we can use that value to calculate our t value. So the mean difference was given, that's equal to 3. Mu d is uh, representing the null hypothesis that we would not expect um, any difference between the scores, and so the average difference would equal zero. 
and then now divided by our estimated standard error of the mean difference that we just calculated, which is equal to 2. So our t value is equal to 1.5. Now we're going to, again, in the center here is 0, because that represents the um, null hypothesis, the mean difference equal to 0. And we'll see where this value resides in that number line, and we see that it falls in this region, and therefore we know that we're going to fail to reject the null because it didn't fall in the critical region and the probability of obtaining that value, the probability of obtaining a t-value of 1.5 is greater than our alpha of 0 0.05. So the question was, um, we needed to determine whether it was likely that this sample came from a population with a mean difference equal to zero. So we would conclude that it is very likely that this um, sample mean difference came from a population um, where the mean difference is equal to zero because we would conclude that 1.5 is statistically um, speaking exactly equal to zero. It wasn't far away from zero enough for us to reject the null hypothesis. So again, we would fail to reject the null. Again, we would just um, indicate that our p-value is greater than 0 0.05 and also conclude that, yes, this sample most likely came from a population where the mean difference is equal to zero. All right, B, now assume that the sample mean difference is equal to 12. So we went from a sample mean difference in the previous example um, that was equal to 3, and now it's increased to 12. Um, and once, again, visualize the sample distribution, which I'll draw in a second. Use a two-tailed hypothesis with alpha 0.05 to determine whether it is likely that the sample came from a population with mu um, d equal to 0. So the critical t has not changed because our sample size remains the same and the alpha level remained the same in addition to the two-tailed test that we were instructed to conduct. So our critical t has not changed. So we're still going to set our critical region at negative 2.306 and positive 2.306. And now we just need to calculate our new t-value given this change in the sample mean difference. The estimated standard error of the mean difference also doesn't change because we didn't have a change in standard deviation or a change in sample size. So that remains the same. So it was 6 over the square root of 9 was equal to 2. Now our t equation is we take the sample mean difference minus the hypothesized population mean difference over the estimated standard error of the mean difference. And here we can replace um, variables, and this is equal to now 12 minus 0. So again, a much larger mean difference, sample mean difference, over the estimated standard error of the mean difference, which is equal to 2. And we get a t-value, which is um, significantly larger than our in our previous example. So we see where that t value resides again in the center. We have the mean difference, the hypothesized mean difference that equals zero. And our critical region was defined by our critical t value. And we're going to see where six resides in relation to zero in the critical t. And we find that it's way out here, right? Um, and in this case, we would reject the null. The probability of obtaining the t-value that comes from a mean difference equal to 12, the probability of obtaining that t-value is less than our alpha 0.05. So therefore, going back to the initial question was we wanted to determine if it is likely that this sample mean difference came from a population with a mean difference equal to 0. And now we've concluded that it's very unlikely that this sample mean difference came from this population where the mu difference is equal to zero, um, and again, indicating that there was some treatment effect. This should make sense because um, we know that the larger the difference is between these um, treatments, the more likely it is that we get to reject the null hypothesis. So again, we're going to say we, we get to reject the null. This 
um, probability statement of P is less than 0 0.05 essentially asks this question. Determine whether it is likely that this sample mean difference came from the population with a mean difference equal to zero. Now, we're saying it's very unlikely. It has less than a 5% chance of occurring if the null were true. And then finally says, explain how the size of the sample mean difference influences the likelihood of finding a significant mean difference. Again, what we're ultimately interested in is the mean difference. Does condition one produce significantly different scores in condition, um, condition two in comparison to condition one? And since that's our focus, we should be able to see that increasing the mean difference from 3 to 12 should produce something very different in terms of where that t-value resides in the distribution of sample mean differences. And so we can then say that um, larger mean differences produce larger t-values which increases the likelihood of rejecting the null. Again, if condition two is producing significantly um, different scores that are very different from condition one, then again, that, that relates to um, giving us evidence against the null. The null says that there will be no difference. So the larger those differences become, the more likely it is that we would get to reject the null hypothesis. Number nine, when you get a surprisingly low price on a product, do you assume that you got a really good deal or that you bought a low quality product? Research indicates that you are more likely to associate low price and low quality if someone else makes the purchase rather than yourself. In a similar study, 16 participants were asked to rate the quality of low priced items under two scenarios, purchased by a friend or purchased yourself. The results produced a mean difference equal to 2.6 with a sum of squared deviations equal to 135 with self-purchases rated higher. Is the judge quality of objects significantly different for self-purchases than for purchases made by others? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. So we're gonna begin by first stating our research and null hypothesis. So the null would state that the, <clears throat> let's say perceived quality of an object or item differs when the object is purchased by you or by someone else. And so we, the null would say that um, does not differ, excuse me, um, perceived quality of an object. And let me just make this little edit. I apologize for that. I had the research um, hypothesis on my mind. Perceived quality of an object does not differ when the object is purchased by you or by someone else. So again, the null is always saying that you will not see a difference um, in these different conditions. So the mu, mu d is equal to zero, no difference. And the research hypothesis is going to state that a perceived quality of an object 
does differ. when the object is purchased by you versus someone else. So the mean difference will not equal zero, that we will see a difference in how um, someone perceives the value of an item when it's purchased by themselves or by someone else. So we would see a difference, so the average difference would not equal zero. All right, um, now we need to figure out what our critical T value is and conduct our test. So I'm going to do that part on the next sheet here. So again, we're going to conduct a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0.05. Okay, so again, it's a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. Our sample size, we need to um, refer back to our sample size. N was equal to 16 to determine our degrees of freedom. So again, degrees of freedom in this chapter, n minus 1. And so degrees of freedom would equal 16 minus 1, and we get 15. So now we need to find our critical t. Okay, so we're conducting a two-tailed test. So we're going to use the second tier at 5%. Our, crit our degrees of freedom equal to 15. And so where those intersect, we get 2.131. Okay, so our critical T is equal to positive, negative, 2.131. So let's draw that out. So we have negative 2.131 and positive 2.131, which establishes our critical region. And now we're going to conduct our t-test, calculate our t-value. And let's just remind ourselves of the values that were given. So we had a mean difference equal to 2.6. And we were given um, SS equal to 135. And again, we have our sample size equal to 16. So to conduct our t-test, t again, t is equal to the mean sample mean difference minus the hypothesized population mean difference over the estimated, st estimated standard error of the mean difference. So we are going to need um, our estimated standard error of the mean difference. We'll use our equation for variance since we were given SS. So let's calculate our variance. It's equal to SS over N minus 1, or degrees of freedom. So we have our SS, sum of square deviations, equal to 135. Degrees of freedom is equal to 15. So in our calculators, 135 divided by 15 and we get estimated standard error of the mean difference equal to 9. Um, excuse me, our variance is equal to 9. Now, given that, we can calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. Square root of 9 over our sample size of 16. Take the square root of that. So 9 divided by 16, and then we'll take the square root, and we get 0.75. Now, it's a um, small estimated standard error of the mean difference. Again, remember the relationship. The smaller the variability, normally the higher the t-value. So now we can replace variables, and we have a mean difference that was given of 2.6 minus 0 divided by 0.75. So in our calculators, 2.6 minus 0 divided by 0.75, and we get a t statistic equal to 3.47 if we round two digits right of the decimal. And now we can use that value to draw our conclusions. And again, in the center, 
the mean difference would equal zero. The null said there would be no difference between these conditions. This value, it's a positive value, and it resides in our critical region, and therefore we get to reject the null. Right? And our probability statement would, again, we get to reject the null. And our p-value, p is less than our alpha 0 0.05. And so we've concluded that um, the quality of an object is affected um, by the person that is purchasing it. Therefore, we would understand that if we buy something um, for a lesser price, doesn't necessarily mean that we think it's of lower quality. But if someone were to buy it for us um, at a cheaper price, we may question the quality. So let me back up here and just um, as we've been doing in the previous example, so we reject the null and I'm just going to write a little bit more about our concluding um, sta statement. So results indicate that the perceived quality of an object does differ if purchased by self or someone else. And we conducted a t-test in the degrees of freedom in parentheses was equal to 15 and our t-value was equal to 3.47 and our probability statement again was less than 0 0.05 and again it's indicating to us that it's very unlikely that we would get this t-statistic of 3.47 if the null were true. And again, since it fell into the critical t, um, critical region, then again, we get to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that um, if you buy something versus someone else purchasing for you, we'll have an effect on the perceived value of that object. Number 11, researchers reported that people rate cartoons as funnier when holding a pen in their teeth, which forced them to smile, than when holding a pen with their lips, forced them to frown. A researcher attempted to replicate this research using a sample of 25 adults between the ages of 40 and 45. For each person, the researcher recorded the difference between the rating obtained while smiling and the rating obtained while frowning. On average, the cartoons were rated as funnier when the participants were smiling, with an average difference equal to 1.6 and SS, sum of square deviations, equal to 150. Do the data indicate that the cartoons are rated significantly funner when the participants are smiling? Use a one-tail test with alpha 0.01. This is something you should try. Again, if you hold the, um, a writing object with your lips versus your teeth, again, research shows that our facial expressions send signals to our brain and vice versa. So if our brain believes that we are smiling, then we may be more... Um, um, interested in laughing and being humored than when we're frowning. So again, it's this back and forth um, signal from the brain to the face and from the face to the brain. Um, so it's an interesting um, research that you might want to test on um, your family members or friends to collect your own data. So we're going to write our research and our null hypothesis um, and we're going to begin with our research simply because when we're conducting one tail test I find it easier to articulate that um, before we state the null. So cartoons are rated funnier when smiling. So our Mu D 
average difference is going to be greater than zero. So first you're going to record them with their lips um, frowning and then smiling. We'll calculate our, our different scores, take how they performed in the smiling condition, subtract the frowning condition and get our D scores and then get our average D. Again, that's what you would do in, in the real world, but here they've summarized that the mean difference is equal to 1.6. All right, um, and the research would say that the cartoon, cartoons here, let me correct that, cartoons are rated um, less or equally funny when smiling. Versus frowning. Might want to add that in here, smiling versus frowning. Okay, just a slight little edit there. And then here, mu d, right, is, we're going to say that it's less than or equal to zero. Okay, so we're anticipating that when you're smiling, that you're going to rate the funny, the, the cartoons less funny and, um, or equally funny when you're frowning. We're gonna need to find our critical t. And that's going to be contingent on our degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom, n minus 1. We have sample size of 25. It's equal to 24. And again, we're going to use one tail test at alpha 0 0.01 to find our critical T value. Okay, so in our T table, we're going to find our critical T. It's a one tail test, alpha 0 0.01, degrees of freedom equal to 24. And we get a critical T of 2.492. And it's going to be positive because, again, we anticipate the second condition to be higher than the first. So our critical T is equal to positive 2.492. And use the next sheet to do our calculations. Okay, so just to carry over information, our critical T is equal to positive 2.492. So we'll set our critical region, whoops, I don't need that one. I just need my positive version, positive 2.492. This is our critical region. Again, the null states that the difference between the conditions would produce an average difference score equal to zero. Let's review some of the givens. We, again, we're using sample 25 individuals. The mean difference was equal to 1.6, and a sum of squared deviations was given equal to 150. So we're going to calculate our t-value, the sample mean difference minus the hypothesized population mean difference over the estimated standard error of the mean difference. So we need to calculate our estimated standard error of the mean difference. And we're given SS, so we're going to use variance in our equation. So first we need to calculate our variance. Variance is equal to SS over DF. We have 150. 150 over N minus 1, which is 24. So in our calculator is 150 divided by 24. And we get 6.25. Now we can use that in our estimated standard error of the mean difference equation. 6.25 over n, which is equal to 25. So 
So 6.25 divided by 25, and we take the square root of that, and we get 0.5. Now we can calculate our t value. So the mean difference, the sample mean difference was 1.6 minus the hypothesized population mean difference equal to 0 divided by 0.5 and we get a t value equal to 3.2. And now we can use that value to determine the likelihood of obtaining that t value. Is it greater or less than alpha? And it depends on where it resides in relation to the null, um, which is the mean difference equal to zero and the critical t value. And we find that it is to the right of our critical t and falls into our critical region. So we know we're gonna get to reject null and that also means that our probability of obtaining that is less than a five percent if the null were true all right um, even though we were in ounce two I'm just going to calculate the Cohen's D since we haven't had an example of that yet so our estimated D in this chapter is equal to the mean difference over the standard deviation so we're going to need to calculate standard deviation because we have variance. Variance is equal to 6.25. So standard deviation would be the square root of our variance. So it would be S is equal to the square root of 6.25. So in our calculators, let's take the square root of 6.25. And we get 2.5. So the mean difference was equal to 1.6 divided by 2.5, so in our calculators, 1.6 divided by, excuse me, not 2.6, I got um, distracted by my other value, 2.5. So divide that by 2.5 and we get 0.64. Again, the Cohen's D is expressing the mean difference in standard deviation units. So it omits the influences of sample size and gives us a better sense of, of change in a standardized unit measurement. This is considered a medium, medium high effect. Anything above 0.8 is high. So this is on the border. 0.5 is considered medium. So we're medium close to high effect. Again, supporting rejecting the null hypothesis. The next problem asks us to calculate R squared. Okay, so for that same example, we're gonna calculate R squared and our equation is the same as it has been for the last two chapters. R squared is equal to our T squared over T squared plus degrees of freedom. So if we replace variables, our t value is equal to 3.2. We're going to square that. 3.2 squared added to our degrees of freedom, which is 24. So in our calculators, if we square 3.2, we get 10.24. Add that to 24. And we get 34.24, 34.24. So now we can take 10.24 divided by 34.24, and we get 0.2299, or we could say 0 0.30. And now we can express it as 30% of the difference in ratings, whoops, in ratings. Again, we're, we're rating the cartoons um, based on whether we're smiling or frowning. So 30% of the difference in scores, the average difference um, was equal to 1.6. So 30% of that difference is is attributed to smiling. So for smiling, um, again, we're going to rate the cartoons different, in fact, funnier than if we're frowning. And 30% of the difference in the scores is because we are frowning or because of the fact that we have a different facial expression 
um, smiling versus frowning. All right, the final thing we need to do is draw our final conclusions. Um, so we get to reject the null. Results indicate that cartoons are rated significantly funnier when smiling. Okay. And we conducted a t-test, degrees of freedom equal to 24. Our T statistic was equal to 3.2. The probability of obtaining that um, T value is less than our alpha. And something um, new in this chapter is that they begin to teach us that it's important to state whether we conducted a one-tailed or two-tailed test. We've learned that conducting a one-tailed test is easier because the critical T will be closer to zero. So it's helpful to those who are consuming the results of our research that they know we conducted a test that was slightly easier than um, had we conducted a two-tailed test. And we've also learned that um, we have to have great justification to conduct a one-tailed test. In this case, the researchers had already tested this and we were kind of recreating that research um, with the example data that was provided. So again, this is a new skill that we specify that we conducted a one-tailed test, followed by our R-squared, and we also calculated D. Our D was equal to 0.64. Incidentally, this R-squared value is considered high, high effect. And um, just to point out that we normally would not see both D and R squared reported it be one or the other otherwise it's redundant nonetheless since we calculated both I just wanted to include them in our concluding final statement